Hi everybody, my name is Megan. Wow, this mic is a lot louder than I was expecting. Do you guys remember when you were younger and people would always ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? A lot of the times people will answer like, I want to be president, I want to be a princess, I want to be an author, an actress. But for me, I'm not sure if the slideshow is working. For me, my confidence started from day one. I was consistently appointed the line leader of my second and third grade classes. And because of that, I always felt really empowered, like I had a lot of confidence and I could do anything I wanted. So I was absolutely crushed when I found out that line leading was not a professional career. <laughs> so after that, I moved on to zoology. I considered animals cool. And I'm not sure if it's because I actually really liked animals or because the word zoology was just really impressive to my friends. But what I do know is that one rainy morning, I encountered a few too many worms and decided that if those are the most basic life form, I don't think I can handle anything more complex. No. So, and this is still a dream I have today, I considered maybe going on America's Got Talent. And not for any really boring talent, like singing or dancing, it's because I had these double-jointed fingers and I thought, like, uh, surely my way to a million dollars. <laughs> Obviously, I haven't pursued those dreams, but it's still something that I'm thinking about every day. One thing you may also notice, though, is that I never mentioned anything about technology. And as the organizer said, this is all about technology this session. Even though my dad was a software architect and always wanted me to get into technology, I didn't think about technology ever. And whether it was because I was just edgy and rebellious and didn't want to listen to my dad, or because I didn't think I was actually good enough for technology, I never found any sort of interest in it. But if you see me today, and as you heard when they were talking about me, I have gotten pretty into the youth tech scene in Cincinnati. So what exactly happened? Well, this is where the title of my this is where the title of my presentation makes more sense. So in the fall of 2016, at the beginning of my sophomore year, my friend phoned me up and asked me if I wanted to go to Revolution UC. And obviously I was like, what is Revolution UC? And she told me it's a 24-hour overnight hackathon, a coding competition. And obviously I was like, why are you asking me? I don't even know how to code. But then she told me it was free and I was absolutely hooked. So <laughs> I decided then that I was going to go. Then she phones me up the day of the event, tells me that she can't go. Something came up. And I had just come back from a debate tournament where I lost a few too many rounds and I wasn't about to like be sad again. So I decided to go and I dragged a friend along with me. I arrived about six hours late. I arrive about six hours late, and I come across this. Now this is like probably a tenth of the amount of food that was there, and they actually didn't photograph all the other food because the parents wouldn't approve. But I arrive there, and there are tubs and tubs of just Indian food, Mexican food. There are mountains of Mountain Dew. There are like towers of Gatorade. There is so much food there. And of course, they had my favorite, which was chocolate pudding. The only thing I did faster than learning how to code at this hackathon was downing 12 cups of chocolate pudding in an hour, which I still think is a record. Keep in mind that I'd come to this event pretty much not knowing how to code at all. I knew around four lines that my dad had somehow gotten through my head, but outside of that, I didn't know how to do anything. So when I arrived there with my friend, we were seeing graduate and PhD students next to us creating like water conservation devices, or they were creating something that would help you with donations. And then for us, we were like, oh, you know what's a good idea? An empathetic meme generator. Basically what this did was it would take a picture of you, analyze your emotions, and spit out a custom meme of you based on those emotions. So as you can see here, I was smiling, but my eyes were closed. So it gave me the title, Suh, Dude. I was also on around 40 minutes of sleep here. So we create this meme generator. And looking back on it, it was really, really 
bad. Like, honestly, I can't believe I actually wrote some of the stuff in there. But what it did teach me was that I had the ability to create impactful things using code, something that I'd never considered at all possible before. We ended up winning Best High School Hack, very competitive competition. There were two total teams vying for that spot, and we won. Um, and what it actually did show me just outside of pursuing tech was that perhaps I should stick to software because I got uh, an Arduino robotics kit right after as my award and I broke it the day of. So I'm going to stick to software. But even further than just that, what it showed me, not just that I had the ability to code, but it also showed me that I had the ability, that I was good enough, that I was smart enough, that I was in general enough for computer science, something that I had never ever considered. So then I decided that I was going to start a club afterwards. I phoned up a friend, we argued over what kind of club we should start, whether or not we even wanted to start a club, but then once we decided yes we're going to start a club, the first thing I did was go into Google and search coding club because I didn't know any. Um, and the only ones I could find were either geographically restricted or age restricted. So I was a few moments away from emailing Code Club, which is an after-school coding club organization based, unfortunately, in the UK. I was going to email them, begging them to extend their membership to US students like me. Uh, when I stumbled upon a, 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 the top 30 under 30 Forbes list in 2016 on like the third or fourth page of Google. Like you know it's getting bad when you're on the third or fourth page of Google. So I opened up this page because I was a little curious. Like how does this have anything to do with coding clubs? And as I'm reading through it, I read up on somebody named Zach Lotta. Now Zach Lotta was 18 when he founded Hat Club. And I was also wondering what Hat Club was. So then. I started reading up on Hack Club and absolutely fell in love with their philosophy. They were creating coding clubs that were run by high school students for high school students that were focused on action and creativity, and that was not something that was often seen. So I decided at the moment that I wanted to start a Hack Club. Since starting in January of 2017, Mason Hack Club's student involvement has impacted over 700 students around the community in various first-time ventures, whether it's Cincy Hacks, Cincinnati's first high school hackathon, or it's the first annual student-run summer coding camp called Hack Camp that we ran last year and this year, or even just the smaller but really unique community outreach programs that we put together every year. Mason Hack Club has already impacted so many students. So I've already, it's probably pretty clear now that I'm pretty into technology. I'm, run, I'm working on a front-end development job that I actually have to go to right after the speech ends. But I'm pretty into technology now. So the only question I really had for myself after seeing all of these stats was, why didn't I get involved earlier? And as, as I asked more people to consider joining Mason Hack Club, or to go to Cincy Hacks, or to even go to Hack Chicago, the other hackathon I ran this summer, I almost always got a really similar response. I'd be terrible, you don't want me. Or, you think I can code? You need to be a genius to code, I am definitely not smart enough. And those sentiments were so commonly echoed Yet it really hit, struck a chord with me because those are the same sentiments that I had a year or two ago. The problem here is not the fear of failure. We too often point that point to that as the reason why people don't do stuff. But in reality, it's not the fear of failure, but it's even worse. It's the crushing acceptance that we aren't good enough that has stopped so many of us from pursuing passions and potentially unknown paths. But if those sentiments are true, the idea that we're not good enough, then why do I have fifth graders at my hack camp every year creating fully functional websites from scratch? It's not that you can't do it. It's that we believe we can't do it because not enough people around us are. And it's that self-confidence barrier that's really difficult to get over. So as I've kind of veered off course a lot, 
in my tech career, I don't, I've created a lot of events that haven't existed before, perhaps got onto some people's bad sides while doing so, but I have veered off the path quite a bit. And although it's been really difficult, I've learned a lot and am still learning a lot right now. So I actually have three things that I've learned on the way that I'd like to share with you today. The first idea that I have for you today is this idea of be absolutely shameless. So story time, um, I was running, once again, the hackathon in Chicago called Hack Chicago. It was a huge event, but we only had a four person team running this, so all of us took on huge chunks of the work. And I was delegated the task of raising $20,000 in just four months, pretty much by myself. $20,000 is quite a bit of money. So I started where I'd always started with the smaller events and just emailed people I knew at companies begging them for money. And though that worked, it was too slow. Around two months out from the event, I still needed another $16,000. I did not know how I was going to get there at the rate I was going, so this is where I became absolutely shameless. I started connecting with so many random people on LinkedIn. Just hit connect, connect, connect. I didn't even necessarily care about if they would think it was weird, maybe if they even knew me. I just connected because I connected to these people because I genuinely believed that they would really enjoy the mission that Hack Chicago was on. So I just connected and I even had the guts to connect with some top level executives at some major companies that you might recognize, such as Dunkin' Donuts, Pandora Music, Encyclopedia Britannica. And while, of course, there were a lot of people who never accepted my request, I think there's about 150 people here who just never accepted it, there were a lot of people who did accept my request, and they were really excited about what I was doing. One of the main things I started doing as I was becoming more and more shameless as I stopped sending really normal emails. I sent really short emails and actually started attaching a one to two minute video to them, which would sometimes take days and days to make, where I would just talk about why I was contacting them and why Hack Chicago was so important. And one of the most incredible stories for me is when I requested to connect with a really high level executive at, at McDonald's, then I also emailed him, and I was just hoping for some words of encouragement, honestly. I would gotten so many rejections at that point that I was like, if they just tell me that this event's going to be okay, then that's already great enough for me. But what he ended up doing was responding extremely positively. He was so excited about what we were doing, and it was the first time that I'd really gotten that connection with somebody who was so high up in the corporate world. So he ends up responding, saying, yes, we would love to sponsor your event and McDonald's sponsored the first student hackathon they've ever sponsored at Hack Chicago with $5,000. In total, Hack Chicago went incredibly. I raised around $24,000 for this 250 person event and though it was really difficult, it made an impact. Hack Chicago became the Midwest's largest high school hackathon and it's not a title that I could really be so proud of if we didn't know how difficult it was to get there. So the next idea I have for everybody is, where are you coming from? What is your context? Now this sounds like a lot of philosophical jargon, maybe it even sounds like the ACT reading section, but what are your resources? What are your barriers? For example, Education initiatives in undereducated areas are the most difficult to implement, yet they're the most impactful. Reducing crime in crime ridden areas is definitely harder than reducing crime in utopia, yet it's so much more necessary. And for me, reducing that self confidence in equity when it comes to tech is so much more difficult here than it is on the coastal areas where tech is very prominent, yet it's so much more needed here. Very often, we'll get caught up in the numbers. It's very easy to compare your event or your program with events that are running across the country. And, I mean, it's easy to get frustrated because of that. 
Events on the coast will almost always have more people, more money, be partnering with cooler companies. Yet if you look at the stats, they don't lie. For Cincy Hacks, 90% of attendees had never been to a hackathon before. Yet 95% agreed that Cincy Hacks inspired them to continue to pursue computer science. For Hack Camp, it's even more astounding. 100% of our in total 180 attendees agreed that they would continue to pursue computer science, even if for, them, for many of them it was the first time they'd ever done it. These stats don't lie, and while the numbers may seem super different, like we have way less attendees than people on the coast, the impact is equal, if not larger here. Remember your context, then remember your impact, because you should be valuing impact above all else. Impact is the metric that compares everybody. And sometimes 180 students in a coding camp coding for the first time has the same impact as a 500 person high school hackathon on the coast. So the third principle, and perhaps the least intuitive, is this one. Sometimes when things are on fire, they don't necessarily have to burn even if a lot of things are on fire. And a story is going to help the best here. If you ever think about when you were in middle or high school and the teacher would ask somebody for a $20 bill and somebody would like reluctantly hand it out and then they'd set it on fire and then everyone would freak out, but then it turned out that the bill was all okay in the end. That's exactly what I'm talking about. For Hack Chicago, and this is going to be the first time that most of our attendees are hearing this, we had a lot of stuff that was catching on fire. We didn't have a venue early enough because we didn't have enough money. And because we didn't have enough, uh, we, because we didn't have a venue, we didn't know how many people would come. And because of that, we didn't know how much stuff we would order. So we had nothing ordered around two weeks in advance. We were ordering stuff for 300, 400, about a week out from the event. Yet, with us staying up until 2 a.m. every single day for weeks on end to make sure this event ran, it did run, and it ran well. The moral of the story here is that when you have a fiery passion, and you combine that with this desire to make incredible things, it is inevitable that stuff will catch on fire. But level-headedness, passion, and determination is how you make sure nothing burns. Before I leave this stage, I want to leave you with this. I have struggled more than I would like to admit when it comes to choosing to veer off the path almost every time. Yet, choosing to go on that unpaved path has shown me this entire world of technology and it has created a second family of CS nerds for me. I'm not here to, to indoctrinate you into tech. I get not all of us like empathetic meme generators. It makes sense. We don't all want to pursue tech. But I'm sharing my story with you because regardless of where your passions lie, whether it's coding, whether it's zoology, whether it's double jointed fingers, I'm sharing my story and my tools with you because we all have the ability and the potential to be trailblazers, to be frontiersmen, to change the world in so many different ways with our own fiery passions. Ask yourself this, how will you ignite the world? Thank you.